The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Introducing Macquarie ETFs. Macquarie's Active ETFs now give you easier access to the global active investment expertise and strategies that were previously only available as traditional unlisted managed funds. Benefit from the transparency and convenience of an ETF structure underpinned by the global investment expertise of Macquarie's fund managers, which offer you additional options for portfolio diversification and the potential for index outperformance. Discover everyday access to active investments with Macquarie. Visit etf.macquarie.com to find out more. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with James Rawlings from DW Private Wealth today. James, thank you for for joining me. As I just said, a nice easy name to remember this time around. (laughs) That's right, likewise. (laughs) Thanks thanks for being part of it. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. No, as we were just saying off air that I really find this helpful listening to all the other people that have been on the podcast and... Um, yeah, whether it's small groups, big, larger groups, it's uh, you always take away a little gem or two. Yeah, it's good to try and have a bit of a mix because there's a lot of like a lot of people part of the ensemble network. Are, you know, one one or two person shops, they have re- reasonably small businesses, and then there's obviously some bigger businesses out there. And whether it's my podcast or the others as part of the ensemble series, there's uh, some of those bigger ones get on there as well and talk about what they're up to. So, so James, give us a bit of an, uh, an idea of what of what you're up to. So, you're a, you're a partner sure. at DW Private. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's been a bit of an on and off again love affair with Steve in the sense that um, you know, with a bit of an hindsight, ten years ago, I probably should have joined him when he went out. He was also um, an advisor with a lot of the banks, hmm. but I guess I just got a bit cosy there for a while and uh, was at NAB in particular for nearly sixteen years and probably overstayed my welcome by about six years. So <laughs> I guess w- what I mean by that is I've got a friend, he works at IBM down here in Canberra and we're at a dinner party together and he said to me, if you stayed a job for more than 10 years, chances are you get to be there forever. So 10 years, he said, was the magical number. He's quite a successful gentleman. So yeah. that I did reflect on that and thought, you know what, ever since 2015, which was my 10 years at NAB in Canberra, wasn't that things went badly, but it certainly wasn't a great time to be a mm. yeah. big ladder. Um, those last five or six years. And then it was just because, you know, you could have got golden handcuffs with, you know, share retentions and obviously a nice client base. And that's probably why I stayed at that. It was hard to leave. Uh, but once I did, uh, thankfully I haven't looked backwards, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, so you're in the ACT. Have you been, have you always that's been right. in Canberra? Have you been some? You've no, been it's a good question. Yeah. So originally from Aubrey. Uh, yeah. Right. And it was part of a, a regional scheme that my father's company had nothing to do with Aubrey, but there was obviously government money. So, that's why they were down there. Then in the late 80s, we moved to Brisbane, Queensland, because it was just too expensive to move staff from Albury to Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, so I went to high school here uh, in Brisbane and went to university and started my career in, in Queensland. Yeah. Uh, then uh, met, met someone who was my girlfriend, now my wife, Louise, and like a lot of people that come to Canberra, she was a, a graduate at Prime Minister of Cabinet, and as a result of that, to uh, to stay with the weeks, and so then I made the move down. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so who do you find? You know, often, like I'm in Melbourne, and I don't, and I often think, you know, advisors working in Canberra, you, you deal a lot with you know people exposed to the government and politics and so forth. Is it like is that a, who have you worked with? Is is it like ordinary people you'd have in Brisbane? It's, like who you actually, work with? with with the banks? I think it was maybe mums and dads, yeah, uh, which I was. Eligible with. So I think there were a number of specialized firms that were, you know, dare I mention addiction advisory that pretty much captured the majority of public servants. Yeah. Whereas uh, in the bank, we found that the majority of our clients were not so much the forgotten people, but people that just probably weren't comfortable going to a, an individual uh, advisory firm. They like to deal with one institution yeah, the t- as a general rule. And that, that was probably more from the retail side of, of the bank, whereas from the business bank, um, you know, it was kind of more 
limited advice pieces. So, for example, someone had, you know, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten figure property, commercial property portfolio, but then they'd want to say, you know, the rest of their money's in cash, and they'd say, hey, here's half a million dollars, you run that money. So they didn't want anything else. They were incredibly wealthy. It was just they were more interested in getting a high return than two deposits. Yep. And if that was through the bank, you were doing that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah so sure. I was, and I guess part of the reason I was there for so long is that I was fortunate enough that when I joined, which was August 05, then come, um, say, March, February 06, a couple of people had retired and was able to merge a number of client bases together. And, you know, as I said at the start, it was almost a golden handcuff. It was, you know, the remuneration was structured such that you were almost guaranteed to get a bonus. Yeah, so it, it was interesting, and it was it was, yeah, it was it was nice to work at the bank because you know lots of people and met lots of great people there. But in the end, I think, as I said, um, we were certainly not welcome. You know, there was no going away party when we left NAB, even though some of my colleagues had been there for over twenty years. It was like duck the door, each on the way out. So it was a pretty brutal experience. Post Royal Commission, but yeah, up until around say 2015, 16, it was actually quite a nice place to work. Yeah, so was that so that was a, that was NAB you were with, and that was a, that's right. Yeah, and that did so. Did they? I haven't tracked what the individual banks did with with kind of getting out of financial advice, but did they shut it down fairly quickly? Or what happened? Uh, no, they sold to MLC, I ah, just yeah. as in divest it. Yeah. And then a few months later, I double bought out. Yeah, MLC. right. That's right. Yep. And it was honestly death by a thousand cuts in the sense that the. The changes just never stopped, and there was always someone new that had a better idea how to provide and deliver advice, even though that person had never been in front of a client. So that is quite frustrating. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I've got grey hairs, and I was one of these crusty old guys in the background. But honestly, a lot of those people that told us what to do and how to do things are no longer in the industry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's not a yep. power over. It was just, um, yeah. In the end, I think, yeah, you know, if your client face and you generally do have an idea, particularly if you have got it. A recurring income stream. Yeah. And so then life for you post but post the banking world in in kind of in a smaller financial planning business is how you That's find right. it. Yeah, a couple of yeah, it went to a couple of firms where one I probably wasn't a fit, the other one I was, but it wasn't the equity position. And I had felt if you're not going to be in a bank where you, you know, one thing they do provide is quote salary conditions, then if you're gonna go out, you go out. So yes. what I've discovered and I yeah, you know, obviously a lot of people been in the industry for nearly thirty years. You're either self-employed or you're employed. These quasi-equity, you know, dangle the model over five, ten years. I haven't found too many models. I think your firm looks like it might do that quite well. But mm-hmm. um, locally, it's it seems to be you're either an employee or you're yeah. yeah. And so how did that? I don't even at what the level of detail you're comfortable sharing. But but that's a that's a the, it's an interesting piece that a lot of employed financial advisors they have this aspiration of owning part of the business that they work with or what but how did that how did that go for you how did you become a part owner yeah. of the business well where i am now it 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 developed in the sense that i was fortunate that my at my previous role any clients that i brought across from that mlc that, that elected to follow me obviously only 12 months um but any of those clients that came across if i ever left that instance previous employer, they came with me, and to their credit, that was the case. Yes. So that gave me a start to go 100% self-employed, yep. along with me purchasing a, a modest book off a gentleman that had decided to retire. Because so I basically merged two, you know, my own book of my uh, lovely clients, and so I've been with sort of circa 17 years, and then secondly, with this group of clients that I could see I'd get on with because we had similar uh, approaches. That provided me at the start because what I didn't want to do is be one of these self-employed guys with the pencil on my ear and yeah, work until two a.m. every day. Yeah, that I, I feel that clients can tell when you're a bit stressed. Clients can tell when you're comfortable, and I definitely wasn't prepared to go a hundred percent starting from zero. Uh, I've got two kids at quite expensive private school, and you know, you know, you know the story. You got two of it yourself, so yeah, it's not a cheap enterprise. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was it was important there was money coming in day one mm. because I didn't want to be uh, sweating in meetings and ha- putting pressure on people. Like, yes, you must you, know, you must deal with me. If they don't want to deal with me, that's absolutely fine. But as you know, you have that approach. You really must do it for you. Mm. Yeah. And so, and so, so DW Private is that? Did you start that, or did you join? Would you know that Steve, Steve before? Sleep Sleep Sleep. Sleep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Steve's the founder. And, yeah. and the primary shareholder. Yeah. Um, and to his credit, he's built it from 
from zero. I just don't have that level of um, capacity. Like I know what I'm good at, but I also know what I'm bad at. And you know, dare I say, it, fixing photocopy machines and <laughs> uh, IT support. It's not my strong point. Is anyone listening to that knows me on this call knows that uh, I can type, but and I can you know let us get on this team's call okay, but I'm definitely not an IT specialist. Yeah, I'm, yeah. So who? So what? What's the mix of your clients look like now? You know the ones that yes. have followed you over the years from different places. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the, the clients that have followed me are generally around say seventy to eighty years of age. Yeah. Uh, the client base that I bought is is again around say that seventy up. So they're a little bit older. You know, traditional financial planning where you're helping them with Centrelink, recontribution strategies, uh, managing the portfolio, and there I say it, making sure that I don't do anything silly. Recent, just caught up with someone this morning that in October wasn't a very big fan of mine. She was down a couple of percentage points. Yeah, it was early on. We don't just invest in the money. And now she's up upset that I said, and I gently remind her, hey, that's half the reason you, you've got me in your corner so that you don't add it to stress. Sure. So that's the existing book that I've got. As far as new business, it is incredibly varied. It's, you know, it could be people in their 20s that just want a one off general advice consultation. Hmm. It could be you know, my age and stage, late 40s, that are getting to that point where they've upgraded their home and now looking to prepare for retirement. And I guess the sweet spot for me is the pre-retirees and retirees still. So sort of at 55 to 65 yep. seems to be where most of my work comes from. Yep. And how do those how do those newer clients find you? Where did, where did where's that work come from? Well, this is the strange thing, my friend. So in the past, you know, today's Tuesday, we would literally have a three-hour meeting, pulling out our hair, stabbing our eyeballs, trying to find new leads at work, you know, putting up the, the butcher's paper. It was genuinely mind-numbingly boring and ineffective, yeah. whereas it's just doing it. You know, a previous account of mine said, look, it's a strange thing, but you've got to make the leap. And once you make the leap, people will follow. So we're based here at the Yarra Lumber Shops in the ACT. It's, you know, reasonably nice, so a bit like maybe uh, Carlton or... Um, uh, not quite Durac, but not no. too far from it. It's a, it's a nice spot. And yeah. you know, there's a mortgage broker down the road. Obviously, we've got mortgage brokers here that I refer to, but you also have external relationships as well. And then you just start bumping into people. There's a, a lady who's a solicitor that just does settlements. You know, friend to friend referred to me. And it's just been quite organic. Yeah. Uh, and then pleasingly, I've uh, caught up with a lovely um, accountant, Yvette Lisley. Uh, she's based at Simon's in Canberra and – she is a financial planner by trade as well as an accountant, but being an accountant in Canberra, there's too much work. So we've elected to, to work on a few clients here as well, which has been mm. a wonderful partnership. Fantastic. It sounds like there's a bit that's keeping you busy, that's for sure. Yes, and, and you know this as well as I do, that it is belief. So I must admit, and that's, I guess, for the benefit of listeners, that I was one of these guys that was a bit bit of a stick in the mud and got that you know, true and show mentality, don't like too much change. <laughs> um, so as a result of that, it took me a long time to, to, to break out. But once I did, like I said, it's I haven't been back once I found the right platform. So I think you know that's something I've picked up from your podcast is that sometimes people make a move after being at a job for some time and it doesn't work. They pivot. That's perfect. Sometimes they have to pivot again. I'm one of those people. Yeah, yeah. You certainly you – certainly sound like you've found the right place for you which is which is which is fantastic lots of lots of credit to you so what what does the business structure look like in terms of advisors support staff sure. like that? how are you operating that we've got on the ground there's six of us in the office here based in canberra so two um two in the mortgage broking side so we kind of cover kind of locate my business partner steve owns part of that mortgage choice franchise yep and then we have two support staff locally and myself and Steve. So there's, there's six of us here, and then I've got a remote um, helper based in the Philippines, and it, that works out really well. And I also use um, Atlas outsourcing for the paraplane as well. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so what are the what are the in house people doing that you've got there? Yep. So on the wealth side, it's really two uh, client facing advisors and two support staff. One of those support staff, Andrew, more than likely will be an advisor within say twelve eighteen months, and. I, that seems to be Steve's approach to to work organically. Yeah. Um, and I've certainly had a front row seat for him as well, watching his success from literally nothing to to being, you know, arguably one of the better advisors in Canberra. Mm, fantastic. And you th- so you think you'll help him through professional year? Because it's something like there's a lot of press being yeah, written yeah. about a lot of yes. a lot of press being written about smaller businesses. Are they actually going to do the professional year? You know, it's a it's a it's a big cost and 
a lot of time, like actual dollars, sure. and then there's time involved and all the rest of it. But you're a you're a big believer of yes, do it internally. One hundred percent, because we're as you said right at the start, we're in the nation's capital. It is a public service town. We hate to admit it, but it is, and they pay well, have great conditions. So if we don't capture staff and I guess offer you know the prize, we we just won't retain. So I think you need to hold your staff's hand from from way to go. I was at a look at years ago. I went to a a conference as part of the, the licensee that we were with back then, and and there was someone got up on stage and he ran a successful financial planning business in a country town somewhere. I can't even remember where it was, but he was talking about they kind of had this challenge of the, the bright people leave to go to the cities, and they they had this this you know, trouble keeping people, and and that professional year is one thing that firms can do now, but they. They were introducing like ownership in the business to people that were really young, like in the client services type team, client service type people. If they saw good prospects in them, they gave the opportunity them the opportunity to earn part of the business over time, in as a means to try and keep them without. You know, otherwise they leave and go to the city for a for a high paying job somewhere else. That's right, and you know it's the great man Warren Buffett said, "You know, show me the incentive, and I'll show you the result." So. Mm. Um, I think if you've got that incentive to work and, and for those younger people in the, in the country towns, if they feel part of business, not just at a personal level, but also financially, then you're all aligned. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always interested to hear how people uh, kind of engage with their clients. Like what's your process between a mortgage broker or a lawyer says, hey, James, call this person that I've just spoken to. I've just spoken really highly of you to them. Like what is yes. what what does your process look like? Can you talk us I've through those steps? I've got a um, yeah, sure. I've I've got a number of processes in the sense that you know for, for when it's word of mouth because you, you know as well as I do that's another level of referral. So when it's word of mouth, it's just a complimentary meeting, really just to see if we can work together. Mm. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we'll generally do the old mud map of the, this is where you're at. This is what we would recommend if you were going to engage us. Um, if that if you're comfortable with that, great. We can go forward. If not. No troubles at all. So basically, be an honest broker. I, I'm not really one of these advisors that wants to you know, keep a couple of strategies in the back pocket because I feel that your best, you know, obviously, the general nature. I don't mean you know, down to the last sets, but if you provide a bit of a general strategy that clients can understand, they I find they'll sleep on that, talk to their spouse um, if they have a partner, and reflect, and more often than not, they'll proceed. Whereas if in the past, when I've been at the bank, I've been a bit cagey and, you know, because again, you know, we love public servants. I'm married to one, so there's no offense there. But if there's a perception that something's free, it probably won't be treated uh, as respectfully as if it, if there's some commercial relationship. So for the word of mouth, like you said, but it's from a solicitor, I'll have a complimentary meeting. Whereas if it's referred by other, because there's a couple of accountants that refer to me, but if it's from an accountant, I will just invoice for my time. And if they proceed to a plan, we'll obviously take away that general advice fee from the plan fee. But if they don't, then they've paid you know, typically $440 for a one-hour consultation. Gotcha. Okay. And then so I say, the, the client says, yes, we want, to, we want to go ahead. Like, What are you, what are you doing then? How, are you using any tools to get yeah, so information? Sure. Yeah. So I'm, again, a bit of a dinosaur. So I would then like to have a second meeting to go to yeah. the client profile, the fact find. Yes, so there's no surprises. So again, mentioned grey hair a number of times, but I'm one of these guys that literally lived through the global financial crisis. Was fortunate my eldest daughter Eve was born during that time, and I think if she was at time, it, it was really awful. So um, that was a really, I guess, lightning pot moment to say, hey, when someone says they're balanced, maybe they're not balanced. So now I'll, I'll literally give them an example and say, you know, hypothetically, Tony, you've got six hundred thousand. Today is Tuesday. We're catching up next Monday. That six hundred thousand is now worth four hundred thousand next Monday. Uh, sadly, there was a nuclear explosion in Manhattan. What's your reaction? You know, a you throw a brick through my window. B are you okay? And that those re- you know, I'd sound a bit graphic, but I think sometimes we need to be graphic to cut through because sometimes the risk profile, yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, to quote Harl Banky, you know, it's a tick and flick. Whereas I think we need to drill down, and I want to eyeball them, James. I don't just want to hit you. Know, I know. We're meant to do teams a lot. I do do the odd teams at Google meet, meeting, but I feel that, you know, feeling the temperature of the room and you can really get a sense of, um, you know, if, if the client's going to be comfortable with, with their particular risk profile or not. Yep. Yep. And so is that. Once it's done, yep, here you go. Is that 
like the the, the questioning that you, you that you've got there is that a like is that something you've developed yourself? Is it a licensee yeah. kind of thing? Like how, yeah. how do you? Yeah. Oh, we're with uh, Single Point Alliance. Uh, yeah. Shout out to Glenn Clay. He's a wonderful um, advocate of the Alliance. Well, um, with Centre Point Alliance, but yeah. So obviously we follow the standard risk profile. You, you obviously did that by law. We go through the client profile, but then I will do the hypothetical ones sure. as well because. And particularly if I sense that it's going too well, in, 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 I, I'd rather have some robust discussions. As you can probably tell, some, sometimes people think I'm abrasive. If not, I just like to test the limit at the start because you know and I both know that sadly, um, you know, awful events will happen and do happen and you're best to have a little bit of bandwidth at the start rather than, you know, sunshine and rainbows all the way and then suddenly the big dark, dark storm comes in and uh, – yeah, things can turn quite quickly. Yeah, it's it, that um, kind of the the risk profiling type exercise we we do on our side. I I often start that conversation by saying I'm going to take you through a series of questions here, and they're they're mostly negative, and they're negative on purpose. Because pe- you know, no one's going to panic that things have gone up too much. People will panic that it's gone down too much, uh, and mm-hmm. and so on purpose. All of these questions are: what happens if it drops by twenty percent? And if, what what if you're Commonwealth bank shares go to zero and it completely disappears. What do you think you you know what your reaction might be? All of these hypotheticals to to land on a to land on something at the end. So it sounds like we're doing a similar kind of process there. Yeah, and I think that's experience as well. In that you know, as I said, the banks were fairly transactional. You know, people would come on quickly, but they would leave quickly for whatever reason. Whereas, as you know, with your business and everyone mm-hmm. listening. We're not looking for, I guess, one-off relationships. We're looking to partner with people, and dare I say, with families as well. So, yeah, you have a job uh, for the client, as you know, they'll typically not only refer uh, friends, but also family as younger uh, members of the family, and that's that's mm. a true privilege. Yeah, yeah. So you you done your fact finding type exercise with them. Yep. Um, what's the next step after that? What happens then? It's uh, research. So you know, we obviously got quite a large probably so you know, everybody research, uh, wealth software, et cetera, and also just get a sense for what they're after. So, you know, again, um, you know, this is a recent left-wing city, not, not to demonise the town, but it's, that's all good. But obviously, industry super is very popular here, and we have more that not only do we um, you know, we're able to work with, say, Australian super, but they actually refer clients to us as well. Half so there is a, a very strong bias uh, towards industry funds, just, I guess, because of that whole non-for-profit uh, and we're able to work with clients around that. Yep. So, yep. So you'll get a bit of a sense if that's what clients are seeking. Other clients, you know, are all, let's go for the moon. And, you know, then we might move, you say, a Hub24 uh, platform. That's probably our preferred retail. And then sometimes with the accountant referrals, it's clients with self managed super funds, where again, we're just managing a portion of the money. So the accountant is obviously. Working through the administration, we're engaging the client just to look after that particular part of the money. Yep, yep. And the, the investment management part of the financial advice equation. How do you how do you deal with that? Yep. Typically, core satellite. So you, you've got you, you've got my degrees in the back thought that look better than a Vanguard poster. But we deliberately have a Vanguard poster in the office, not not to promote Vanguard per se. But just to, I guess, demonstrate that in the end, you know, we could talk about the GFC as we did. Guess what? It's a very fake line on the on the thirty year charts now. So I guess we do like index funds. I mean, shouldn't shouldn't say this on a financial planning podcast, but I am a bit of a Scott Pape fan. Yeah. I think um, a lot of you know, not not everything he stands for, but I think a lot of the things he, he promotes, he index funds for lower uh, balance clients does make sense. I think. Yeah. Try to play God and say yes. I've got this. I've been to this lunch with this fund manager. The best thing since sliced bread. It takes us a long time, but I think we've all evolved to know that it's very hard to beat the market as a mid long term. So we would use the index funds. But the reason I'm not against um, active management as well through, say, a mod sec SMA, mm-hmm. is because they are the ones that I guess were watching the duration of bonds a couple of years ago when the, when the rate cycle went up, whereas the poor old Vanguard, you just have to go up from the ride, it went down, it did go back up. No one lost any money if they didn't sell, but I think that's what the active management can provide is smooth out. Uh, as we turn. So that's that's the way we typically run the majority of our portfolios. And then we do have some core tilts of try, tried and tested managers, but that's probably more for our high net worth clients as opposed to the mums and dads that want something to consider. Yeah, good sir. 
And you are you're not doing any individual kind of stock picking with with clients. It's all you know, you know Vanguard or indexes or major funds. Yeah, I, haven't, I haven't been the best stock picker personally, and I've, yeah. like a fund that's got a leaky taps. It's taken me twenty thirty years to really. I've had a few wins, few losses, but no. I mean, you know, obviously, if I had to call it for this year, obviously ResMed seems to be the fund manager's number one pick, and it's done reasonably well, but it hasn't done that well. And you think back to last year, Woodside, great story, great company, but of course this year it's profits and um, distributions were down. BHP, no different. So yeah. I guess that's my concern with the direct shares, but I think if I had um, higher account balances, you know, friends with people with JB Weir, Bob and Stanley, these sort of firms in Sydney and Brisbane, and, you know, they've got, you know, 15 analysts behind them as they sit in front of clients. I mean, we're, we're not servicing that sort of level of well. Yeah. And so I guess you have to cut your costs to do the presenting advice. Yep. And so the, the, the presentation of the advice, how does that type of meeting run for you? Yeah, so that would just we would generally again transparency is everything in this city at, for the whole industry under best interest and so forth. So we would typically a couple of days before the meeting, strange, but I feel comfortable setting the clients the plan. Oh yeah, right. that way they they've had an opportunity to read it. There's not there shouldn't be any surprises or anything mm. untoward. So that way they can go through it. Often we'll get a few comments, but more often than not, they even though we tell them not to print it out, they'll print it out and bring it along. Even yeah, yeah. Copy, and then go through it. But generally, it's confirmation the plan of what we've discussed in that um, discovery meeting. So, you know, as a general rule, the, the advice strategies that we deploy here for, for the clients I deal with are, are not overly complicated. It's, you know, your recontributions, incomes, you know, set, you know, sense like strategies and so forth. So it's not, we're not, you know, looking to change change the wheel, redefine the wheel. It's more just doing the right thing uh, and, and with the client's budget as well. So from a pricing point of view, we're not, the most expensive in Canberra, but we're certainly not, obviously not the cheapest. But mm-hmm. we I guess we like to have clients for the long term as opposed to having a very big plan for you and then never seeing them again. Yeah. And I think there's like, you know, I think you, you kind of downplay it. I think we all do it to say, oh, you know, the, the strategies aren't too complicated. There might be some super contributions or some you know, Centrelink sheltering money in one versus the other to get Centrelink benefits and so forth. Like, we all know that because we do it day in, day out. But to the to the person that's walking into us for the first time, that's all it's all brand new to them, and you know you can understand why there's such a demand for for financial advice at around that kind of fifty five to sixty five ish uh, age bracket where someone goes from well, I just show up to work and then once a fortnight I get paid. It's not that complicated. I just need to manage my money from once a fortnight. But then all of a sudden it's like, well, how do I start a pension with my super? What about inheritance? What about the age pension system? There's all of these, all of this complexity that uh, unless you've studied it, unless you've worked in it, you're not going to know it. So you know, a lot of value there for, for, for those that are going through that stage. So what's next for you? What's on what's what's the plan? It's, yeah, I guess it's just organic growth. So obviously borrow money to pick up this client base. So goal is have that get paid off, say, within five to seven years. Yeah. Uh, and the best way to do that is obviously to take the clients to do a good job but also pick up new work. Yeah. And please leave that. That's what is happening at the moment. Um, my business partner is, you know, is, as you know, there's lots of movement. Uh, so I think you know, there's a couple of acquisitions he's considering, but definitely won't speak for him. But mm. for me, I'm quite comfortable now that I've got a bit of momentum, that I've got quite a nice lifestyle as well. Fortunate enough to be in the same suburb so I get to walk to work. Yeah, that's quite quite nice and you know i as i said i share one of the staff here and have remote support so coming from a bank that's like a miracle well i was lucky to get 10 15 hours of support towards the end of my tenure at the banks and even though i was managing a reasonable sized portfolio it was democratized in a sense it didn't matter if you had 10 clients or 200 clients we all got the same amount of support which looking back was i have a recent possibility that it was a royal commission it was just unbelievable it's about to allow himself can you no, and and the, the stakes are going to happen. There's only so many hours of the day, and I guess that's yeah. It, you know, I've got a couple of friends, particularly X and Ab guys up in Sydney. We always cry thinking, "Wow, this business was so successful, doing so well, good clients, and now you know, I doubt it'd be five, ten percent of what it is today." So, I think it really goes to show, you know, again, that incentive, you know, incentivization in that if you have an incentive to look after client base and you're rewarded for through good results and look you know doing the right thing, you you'll keep doing that. But if you're not and everybody's kind of socialized, often you don't get the same results. So that's 
I sound like I know everything but that comment, but it's it's been a really nice leap of faith to finally go out and do it and see that it works. Yeah, yeah. By the sounds of things growing nicely, uh, potentially a new a new advisor coming through the ranks over the next year or two. Sounds all all good things. Yeah, it's and you know, it, just shout out to to yourself and, and the ensemble team because genuinely every Thursday I get a little buzz and you know, like I said at the start, it's it's really a breath of fresh air to hear other people doing things like myself. But then to hear other um, incredible people with, you know, 30, 40 people in the business and checked out your website earlier and you guys look like you're doing quite well. So mm. credit, credit to you as well. Yeah, that's it. You know, I've got to get some, some uh, you know, this is at the start, there's, no, there's big businesses and there's smaller businesses. You need to get some some people from the bigger businesses on 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 to kind of talk about the challenges that they've got and, and how they're dealing with it and how did they get to be 30, you know, 30 plus people. In most cases, it's through acquisition over time. Very few have kind of grown orga- organically to that level. Absolutely. Yeah, get a few more on. Well, look, James, thank you for joining me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to speak with you. And, uh, yeah, you better listen to yourself back on Thursday morning if you, <laughs> if you want to do so. As I said, first time caller, long time yeah. listener, and I guess a shout out to everyone else listening that is afraid to do this or – I'm comfortable you've made it really easy and uh, credit to yourself for the way you handle these meetings. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. No worries.